we all have seen changes in our lifetime. Changes that have made life easier, more convenient, if you will. Um, how many of us grew up in a situation where there was no telephone in your home? Okay. How many of us grew up in a situation where there was a telephone, but it was a party line? Or at least maybe you're familiar with a party line. As time has gone on, it's upgraded, hasn't it? It's moved from no telephone to party line to a single phone, from a rotary phone to a push button phone, and now from a, a landline to a mobile. Many of us don't even have a landline at home because of the integration of our mobile system it's for the 911 uh, process so that they can identify where you are at. It's change took place. And for some, in our culture, in our world, it was difficult. No, I never wanted that. I don't want that. I remember one time in seminary, I said, there's no way on earth I'm ever going to have a computer. Uh, I'm going to continue to type my papers, or at least Becky would type my papers uh, for seminary. And then someone gave me a, a very innocent, very fundamental computer and found that, wow, this is even better than I could ever have dreamed of. And now I can't do without that computer, or namely that computer is my cell phone now, which I'm recording on uh, this morning for uh, our convenience. So changes have come that have progressed society. Some changes have brought negative impacts upon our society. But changes that have come with the progress of our society are like unto the changes that should take place in our hearts and lives as we grow in Christ. And Peter is focusing upon providing a reminder to God's people about the change that took place in coming to faith, but the ongoing change that needs to take place as a result of that faith. And we could call that sanctification, although he doesn't use the word here, that we are now progressing toward holiness, progressing towards an experience of growing deeper and broader and higher in our faith. And so here, that change, that growth in the knowledge of Christ is to be expected. It should be longed for. We must long for this growth and development. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus shares this thought in verse 6. The Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They, for they shall be satisfied. That hungering and thirsting that he talks about here and the satisfaction that we receive is something that never stops. We hunger and thirst and are satisfied and out of that satisfaction we continue to hunger and thirst. We never come to the place where we stop hungering and thirsting after righteousness. If you think about it in terms of your daily meal plan, uh, how many of us decided that I don't want to eat anymore? There's very few people in their conscious mind make that decision. My dad didn't make that decision. My dad made that decision because his mind was gone. And so he stopped eating. He had no desire to eat any longer. And it drastically affected his body. And so too, when we find ourselves not longing to grow in righteousness, not longing to grow uh, in hunger and thirst for it, we will find ourselves wasting away spiritually. You see, once we come to faith in Christ, there's a unique transformation or a switch that takes place in our head and heart that we long to know more about Him. We want to grow in Him. We can't help but do it. And Peter is encouraging us to realize that that's a, something we should expect, something that we should long for, something that we should grow in. And so this morning, as we unpack verses 5 through 9, uh, I'd like for us to understand that he gives us three fours, not F-O-U-R or four, um, but four, F-O-R, in verse 5, he says, for this very reason, and then in verse 8, for if these... And verse 9, for whomever, whoever. And so these three fours are all preceding a verse, verse 10, therefore, uh, for him to build his argument concerning the necessity of a fruitful effort to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's look, explore together the reasoning, Peter's reasoning this morning. He says in verse 5, the first four, 
For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with. So he says, for this reason, he makes this argument and he points back to the previous teaching. Everything he's just taught or written in verses 1 through 4 is of import. For these reasons, for this reality, for the reality first that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him, that is the first reality. The second reality is that we might be growing and may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus and understanding that we have the same faith as Peter, who is an apostle and a servant. So for these reasons, for this very reason, he points back to all those things because of the power of the promise, because of the work of the Lord in our lives, he gives us the reason for the effort. For that, for those things, because he's provided all the power and everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. Listen, because he's provided it doesn't mean it necessity works out every day in our lives without effort. He's saying make every effort to be zealous, to be serious about this, to supplement, to add to the faith that we have. And we're not talking about piling on, that we pile on these virtues, but we understand that they need to permeate our hearts and lives. Your faith, the saving relationship with God through Jesus Christ is what he's talking about. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith, your personal faith, your personal experience with God that's founded on the person and work of Jesus Christ outlined clearly in the scriptures so that we might have a guideline for us to grow in and mature in. And so here we want to contemplate that reasonable effort, the reality that we need to make an effort, make every effort, make it reasonable, make it something that we can reason over, that we can contemplate, that we can mull over in our hearts and minds. So the challenge for me and challenge for you is how hard are you working at growing in Christ? I would suggest that in our world, coming to faith in Jesus Christ is just sufficient. Because all we're concerned about is being saved and then doing as we please. If that's true, I would suggest that that person's probably not saved. Oh, pastor, you bold. Yes, I'm bold. Because if true transformation took place when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you would long to love him. You would long to worship him. You would long to have your life continually trained and changed unto Christ-likeness, unto righteousness. How hard are you working at growing in Christ? I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about how are you maturing and moving on and understanding that you are growing in him, taking that faith foundation in him and building upon it in such a way that you're letting him work out what he has worked in. How much time do you spend preparing for a Bible study? Is it just before you get there? Is it the night before? How are you preparing? How much time do you spend praying to God? Do you call out to Him when things are going awry? Do you ask for prayer help? Do you ask for people to pray over you and to be knowledgeable about your prayer needs? Uh, we are so isolated now, I I'm, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned that we are not reaching out to each other in, in prayer. Yes, we have people who are praying and prayer warriors, but the body is not exercising itself and it's hurting because we're not praying effectively. We need to make a reasonable effort for this very reason, make every effort. And so he describes for us first the reasonable effort, that, that we make every effort, that we consider how we're going to do this, how we're going to accomplish this. But then he qualifies that effort by suggesting to us that the second four, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with, it qualifies that first four. It's not the second four, it qualifies the first four. The foundational reminder, it's to your faith. Uh, some scholars suggest that there are eight things, and the number one is faith. I would say that faith is the foundation, and then there are seven things that we are add to it, that we supplement with it, that we let permeate into our faith, the understanding of what God wants us to grow in. And so there are some qualities that we build upon the foundation. If you will, Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 
chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And so there's this foundational experience, foundational understanding. It's our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we trust him, that intimate personal relationship with him. That faith is foundational. Therefore, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Some translations use the term excellence or goodness, but the whole word virtue suggests moral excellence, that life that pleases the Lord. Are you putting your best hand forward for him? Are you bringing glory to him in all that you do and say? Now, see, what we tend to do is we tend to excel in things that we think are not spiritual. We think that I'm going to excel at work. I'm doing well at work. I'm at, praise God. I'm being, being blessed. I'm winning these awards. I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. My income is increasing. And we get caught up in that. And we forget to realize that who blessed you with that? Who provided for you for, for that? What is the excellence in that? Where did that come from? And sometimes we get caught up in saying it's my personal effort. I would suggest that you need to rethink that. That provision, that blessing, that provision there is by the Father. That God, through Jesus Christ, is anointing you with that success. And so if we're adding to our faith a virtue of excellence in all that we do, because Paul tells us that when whatever you do, in word or deed, do all for the glory of God, there's nothing that's not under that umbrella. That we find ourselves realizing that we add to our faith excellence. That we do it perfectly. That we do it for God's glory. That we realize that he's the one who receives the blessing as we praise him and adore him. Realizing that adding to our faith excellence is something that we should long for. I think I've shared this story before. A brother in Christ, his father was the a music director or teacher at uh, Moscow Seminary. And he came to the United States to visit his son. And we had practiced as a choir so diligently to excel at this piece of music. And we sang it perfect. We sang it perfect. No miss-ups, no miscues. Every part of the music was perfect. And we went to that brother. And we asked him, what did you think of the choir? And he challenged us to realize that we failed. And he said, who are you singing for? Because he didn't want us to be singing for him. He didn't even want us to be singing for the one who wrote the piece of music. He wanted us to be singing for the Lord. And when you sing for the Lord, it's distinctively different than just trying to be excellent. Because we're not trying to be excellent here. We're not distinguishing our faith and saying, oh, now we need to do this excellent work. We need to do things excellently. No, we need to add to our faith excellence. Add to our faith experience a longing for excellence, a longing for virtue, a longing for goodness, a longing for moral excellence. Then he also tells us, secondly, this virtue for Supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. And it's the same knowledge that we've been talking about, that fullness of knowledge that Jesus wants us to embrace, that knowledge of the world, that word, that spiritual knowledge of Christ, that we're adding to now our faith, both excellence and the word. Knowledge of who God is, understanding the fullness of what he's revealed here. Uh, we don't need to make this word uh, applicable to our lives because it's antiquated. It already is applicable to our lives. We don't have to make it look good by this world standard. We need to embrace the truth of it in its simplest way so that we understand that we're growing in the knowledge of excellence of our faith so that we understand this growing relationship with Jesus is powerful 
This growing relationship with Christ is significant and it affects not only our heart and the excellence we do, but our head and the knowledge we know so that we put the two together and we start living out this faith faithfully. And then he says, and knowledge with self-control. With self-control, to have one's passions under control through the Spirit. To realize that this self-control is not just doing the daily diligence of discipline to make sure that we're doing it right. Because then it's about us. But we're surrendering our hearts to the Lord in such a way that the Spirit is quickening and enabling us to accomplish the things that please the Father. Practicing self-control. Recognizing that self-control comes out of the knowledge of who Jesus is, comes out of the excellency of our faith. So they're permeating each other. It's not adding on top of. It's permeating each other. He goes on that we need steadfastness. Not only knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness. To see it through, to persevere, to have the ability to continue in the faith against all pressure. Because that's what the world does. You start living for Jesus, they start paying attention. And they start pointing fingers. And they start challenging you. And they start questioning you. And all of a sudden, you give up because you can't stand the pressure. What Peter is saying, listen, if your faith is real and you long to serve the Lord, you long to grow in Him, be excellent at it. Not only be excellent at it, be so filled with the knowledge of the Word of God and the knowledge of who Christ is that you will be equipped and enabled to be steadfast, to be faithful, to persevere. But sometimes even in that perseverance, we can find ourselves full of ourselves. Because look what I did. Look how I put through. Look how I finished. Look how I persevered. But the reality is that then he adds steadfastness with godliness realizing that our piety our devotion to the lord that comes from our heart is to be displayed as we see all these things working together that our faith is growing in excellence and that excellence is in the knowledge of christ and that knowledge is that practicing self-control and that self-control is Israel forth in the steadfastness to persevere in godliness Desiring, desiring to be holy, to be godly, to be of that mind that we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. He helps us to understand that power that's being displayed here. Now, I want us to note something. That these first five, who do these first five deal with? What are these first five in response to? It's a response to our faith, are they not? Correct. And that faith is in relationship with whom? Yes, with God the Father, through God the Son, and anointed by God the Holy Spirit. So that we understand that the focus of these first five is developing this relationship and this effort of adding to our faith or supplementing our faith because of our relationship with God, we long to know Him more. We long to understand his truth. We want to accomplish his will. And these five deal with that. But then when we come to number six and seven, brotherly affection and love, here we're talking about how we take this relationship with God, which you notice there's five, as a powerful reminder of the faith that we're building upon, so that we take these five now and find them impacting and influencing the effectual love we have one for one another. How do we now take this relationship with God, that of life, because that's really what he's talked about, now how does that issue forth in godliness? How do we now live it out in the dailiness of our lives? How do we experience that? And so Peter says this, and godliness with brotherly affection. That word brotherly affection is that Philadelphia Greek word. And we always understand it that way. It's our fellowship. It's our family structure. It's caring for others and meeting their needs. It's one thing to come alongside of a brother and say, I love you. I care for you. I'll pray for you. 
It's distinctively another thing to come alongside that same brother and say, I'll do this for you. I'll meet that need. I'll provide for you. What a blessing to realize this wonderful, powerful relationship we have with God is supposed to be lived out in the dailiness of our lives so that we are showing brotherly affection toward one another. And then not only that, but that we show brotherly affection with brotherly affection with love, desiring the deepest good for the family, for others, concerning their heart. You see, the reason why we meet the physical need is that we want to come and speak to the heart need. And so we validate this experience we have with the Father by loving one another, by meeting each other's needs, so that we might demonstrate our love that comes from our faith, that finishes in love, and finds itself displayed not only to our brothers and sisters in Christ primarily, but also to the world, that we're meeting the need of the heart. You see, sometimes in our world, we just want to meet the physical needs. We don't want to touch the heart need. We don't want to deal with that heart issue. We, we avoid that. We'll do the brotherly affection, and, uh, but we're not going to do the hard work of the heart. But if you notice that Peter doesn't give you an option, he doesn't say, well, if you think about it, maybe you can practice this too. No, he's saying supplement your faith, that's the foundation, supplement your faith with virtue. Your virtue with knowledge, your knowledge with self-control, your self-control with steadfastness, your steadfastness with godliness. If you're going to be a godly saint, you're going to add to your godliness brotherly affection. And you're going to add to your brotherly affection love. Now, I want you to note something. Because here, we're talking about intertwining cumulative growth. We're not saying that you just add these things up and pile them up and therefore I'm done. I put those on the bookshelf. I've done my, my adding to my faith, my virtue. There's the virtue book. I've added to my virtue knowledge. I've added that uh, onto the shelf. Now I'm going to add the, the idea of self-control. And then I'm going to add steadfastness. And after steadfastness, uh, I'm going to add godliness. And then godliness, uh, brotherly affection, and now love. So now I've got my seven volumes and I've accomplished those things. And I put them on the bookshelf and I go and do my business. If we're to understand what Peter's getting at, if we're to understand the idea that we're to be growing, that there's a cumulative intertwining growth, one faithfully building upon the other until they come full circle. And then when we come full circle, we have to take them off the shelf and start over again. And be sure that we're in that place where we're constantly growing and maturing in Jesus. Because if we're not giving the reasonable effort, if we're not giving the every effort to supplement and adding those things, the qualitative idea of what takes place, we're not really growing. We're not really maturing. When I look back upon my life and my ministry, I'm not the same pastor I began in 1988, for that matter, 1984. I'm not the same person. I've changed. And yes, my looks have changed. I've grown old. I'm grumpier, possibly. But the point is, is that I'm not the same spiritually as I was then. I'm distinctively different. And God has shaped and molded my theology, molded my understanding of Scripture, and He continues to do that. I continue to want to grow and mature in Him. Do I do it perfectly? No. But I long for it. I want to give the reasonable effort. I want to give every reason, make every effort. And I want to qualify that effort by adding these things. And then adding these things. So then we come to the second four. The first four, for this very reason. He qualifies that by adding to your faith these things. Seven of them. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours. 
He's suggesting here that these qualities are yours. They are your possession in Christ. Not something you work for, but something you work out. Are they increasing? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, the effort is put into the working out what God has worked in. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Read that for yourself. Work out what he's worked in. So that we're now giving every effort, and what happens is there's a product or there's an outcome. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it doesn't say, well, it does say in some respect, but it doesn't say that you will be unfruitful in doing godly things. It says you will be ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, even the best effort, if it's not tied to the foundational principle of our faith and the knowledge of Jesus, all that effort accomplishes nothing. Because those qualities that he's talking about all come out of this intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so now we have this connectedness so that we find ourselves that as these qualities are ours and increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. So the challenge for us is the pro productive effort is that we're being effective and we're being fruitful. In what? In being a good Christian. No, that's not what it says. That we be effective and be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can't do great things in the church if we don't have Christ on our heart and mind. He has to be the center of it. That fruitful effort. That desire to be productive for the kingdom always has to have Christ at center. You long to stay spiritually fit. Peter's outlined the qualities that need to grow in us. The disciplines need to be worked on. Trusting and depending on the Lord for the power and the promises are key. Because see, as we look at verses 5 through 9, we can't separate them from 3 and 4. We can't separate them from 1 and 2. And we can't separate them from all Peter's letters. And we can't separate them from the New Testament. And we can't separate them from the Old Testament. God is testifying to you and to me of how we are to live for him daily by understanding that we need to make every effort to reasonably put forth an effort that's qualified by clear-cut qualities that we need to approach and that we realize that we need to be productive because we're accomplishing his will by walking in obedience to it. And then the last point is the forgotten effort. We've looked at the reasonable effort, the qualitative effort, the productive effort, and now the forgotten effort. Now verse 9 is packed with a bunch of information. Specifically, he's talking about those who have lacked these qualities, who are not growing in Christ. And that could be any one of us. But in a broader context, in a subversive context, in respect to what he's addressing in the culture in which he's living, in the rise and the birth of Gnosticism, He's talking about the false teachers in the church, and you'll recognize them because they're not growing in Christ. So he says this in verse 9, the second or the third four. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he, is, he was cleansed from his former sins. For whoever lacks these qualities, that not growing in their faith, not maturing in him, is so nearsighted, spiritual myopia, so nearsighted that he is blind to spiritual things. I challenge you to read the book of Mark and see how Jesus uses the healing of blind people 
to help his audience understand their spiritual blindness. Every time he addresses spiritual blindness, he heals a blind man. It's a powerful image to keep in our hearts and minds to see how Jesus used his words and his healing ministry to open eyes, not physical eyes, but spiritual eyes to see the truth of the gospel. See, these teachers, these people within the context of the church gathered often find themselves forgetful, having forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins, forgotten the wonder of their salvation. That often happens because we're not paying attention to the knowledge we need to be growing in our hearts and lives. We're not desiring to read our Bible every day. We'd rather read Sports Illustrated or, or Good Housekeeping or, or Woman's Today, whatever that's called. We find ourselves longing to be knowledgeable about everything else under the sun except Jesus. Why? Because I've got Jesus already. I've got him. He's right here in my hip pocket. I've accepted him into my heart. Therefore, I've got it made. You've already forgotten, if you're thinking that thought. You've forgotten the power at work in your heart and life to wonder in the majesty of your salvation because you have been rescued. You have been cleansed from your former sins. There's so much stuff in our world that teaches us so much falsehood. Read Ephesians 2. Paul reminds us to remember from which we've come. So that we appreciate, appreciate what we have. Not living in the past, but remembering from which we've come. Remembering our sinful life so that we would not live that again that we live faithfully for Christ because we long for him. God has given us all power to grant to us everything we need for life and godliness. So we need to be sure that we're not forgotten, that our effort is not the one of forgetfulness. If you will, Peter here gives a shot over the bow, a warning for us to understand that, hey, listen, this is serious business for everyone who... Ever, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, spiritually blind, spiritually dumb, if you will, having forgotten that he is cleansed from his former sins. Are we in that place that we haven't hearkened to, to listen to the reality that there's a coming judgment? That's why I had us read Zephaniah chapter 1 this morning. It doesn't continue to get better and better and better and better. There's going to be a time when the fullness of those who come to faith in Christ is accomplished, and then the end will come. And judgment will come upon this world. But if we're just playing the game, we're lost in that judgment. But if we truly put our faith and trust in Jesus, we're going to long to add to our faith all these qualities. And we're not going to forget the fact that we've been healed, that we've been forgiven, that we've been rescued and cleansed from the former sins. We must take the discipline of sanctification seriously. A constant reminder and constant review, constant application, not to make us feel bad about ourselves, but to be thankful that God is constantly giving us hope, encouragement, joy, grace, love, mercy, each and every day. How are we fixing our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith? How is he the one we are fixing, focusing upon? Is he receiving all the glory? I pray that you will make a fruitful effort to add to your faith all these things. Amen.